Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will discuss macro minerals. When we look at macro minerals, we're looking at those minerals that are fed at modestly higher levels compared to like trace minerals and feed additives. They are normally fed in grams per day, expressed as a percent of the ration dry matter. We will routinely test these in forages to balance rations because they will vary from feed lots and cuttings from time to time. And of course, we cannot use NIR analysis for minerals because they are inorganic molecules and are not seen by the equipment. Let's take a look at a critical concept called availability. In this example, we will use calcium. We will not use this in all the macro minerals. If we look at calcium availability, the new NRC increased calcium availability, which means it is more available to the cow than we earlier thought, somewhere around 50 to 60 percent. More about that in a few minutes. A cow will need roughly 60 grams of calcium. This would be for a 1,300 pound cow giving about 80 pounds of milk. The NRC, however, will recommend about 158 grams based on 0.6% of the ration dry matter and 25 kilograms of intake. Another important concept is homeostasis. In other words, how does the animal control calcium or phosphorus or other mineral levels? And calcium is critical because if calcium levels go down too low, the cow will go down, as in like milk fever, or have hypocalcemia. The homeostatic system in the cow is controlled in terms of calcium of several different sites and functions. First of all, it is controlled at the gut level, which means absorption of calcium from the diet. It may take two or three days to turn this on or off. The calcium can also be mobilized from the bone, and that takes eight or ten days to mobilize bone resources. This is important when you think about milk fever and other calcium-related disorders. Vitamin D is a very important vitamin that regulates both calcium and phosphorus. Therefore, it must be made in the diet and converted over to some other metabolic forms by both the kidney and the liver. The parathyroid is another homostatic mechanism which attempts to keep calcium at the right level. And finally, we know age has an impact. For example, calves are very efficient of absorbing calcium, maintaining calcium, where older cows like Jersey cows may have more problems with this, leading to such disorders as milk fever. Another way to look at calcium and phosphorus are ratios. And interestingly, the cow has different ratios depending on her biological function. For example, you can see the ratio on maintenance is modestly close at 1.25 to 1. If you look at maintenance plus pregnancy, that number will increase. Blood levels are approximately 2 to 1. For example, 10 milligrams per milliliter versus phosphorus at 5 or 5.5. Bone is 2 to 1. And basically, diet should be less than a 3 to 1 ratio of calcium to phosphorus. You Useful number some time to time to reflect on. Let's move on to another macro mineral called phosphorus. And let's look at the new exciting information on phosphorus availability. Back in the NRC 1989, we assumed phosphorus was available at about a 50%. Notice some other countries more recently have increased this number on up, all the way to France at 70%. When the new NRC came out in 2001, this number was raised up to nearly 70%. Let's see what that does here in our recommendations. Certainly one question is, are all feeds exactly at 70% availability? And of course, this data from the NRC 2001 clearly illustrates the answer is no. Forages generally are at about 64-65% phosphorus availability, concentrates such as corn and soybean meal at a higher number of 70%, and our mineral sources listed there are in the 80-85% to range. So certainly you can see how we achieve that 70% figure and why that number was incorrect back in NRC 89. So based on these calculations, what are we now recommending for phosphorus? For dry cows, I like to use the actual gram levels, 35 to 50 grams. 35 for jerseys, 50 grams for Holstein and brown Swiss cows. If you get over 60, 65 grams, you may now maybe see some inner negative interactions. Early lactation cows, I'm going to go back to the level of the dry matter, 0.38% of the dry matter. At one time, we were up at 0.4, but we've now seen newer data from Wisconsin and Maryland suggesting these levels are more than adequate. Mid-lactation cows, 0.35%. Late-lactation cows, 0.32% of the ration dry matter. Certainly one of the questions besides cost, why are we lowering phosphorus in the diet? And the answer is because of our environmental situations. Look at this data from Cornell. We look at four different levels of phosphorus in the diet. We then look and say, well, how much then does the cow secrete or excrete in the manure? Notice a fairly significant numbers. But if you're a dairy manager, let's ask the question, how many acres do I need to spread this manure over to avoid environmental and build up a phosphorus in my soil per 100 cows? And 
that's a huge number. Notice that at the very high levels of phosphorus, nearly 300 acres to get rid of that manure. We're at more modest levels that we're now recommending around 180 to 160 acres per cow. So it's a win-win. A win for environment, a win for dairy farmers reducing feed costs. This represents a savings of about $10 or $15 per cow per day in phosphorus we don't need to purchase. Another macro mineral would be salt. Well, actually, it's not salt. Maybe your take-home message, cows do not require salt. Cows require sodium and chloride, the key minerals in their requirement tables. A good guideline from Wisconsin, which has a little age behind it, one ounce for maintenance and one ounce for every 30 pounds of milk. Under heat stress, you will have to increase the sodium levels as the cow will excrete more sodium and has a higher sodium requirement. If you see cows licking urine or trying to suck urine off the concrete, this can be a very easy sign of a shortage of either sodium and or chloride. Salt or sodium and chloride is the only true craving an dairy cow has to meet her requirement and can be offered free choice and she more or less regulates her requirements. Now let's take a quick peek at some of the other macro minerals. In the magnesium update, certainly we know that as you feed more fats and oils or lipid material, magnesium requirements go up. We recommend around 0.3 to 0.35 in the total ration dry matter. We also know there's a very clear relationship between magnesium and potassium. Classic situations in growing heifers and beef cattle of grass tetany, when if the high potassium levels are too high, it ties up magnesium resulting in cattle that have this disorder. We also know magnesium can compete with calcium for absorption, so be careful you don't overfeed either one of these, leading to deficiencies in the other. Another one to look at is potassium. Potassium is kind of a new one. First of all, it is implicated in grass tetany, which we just mentioned, mentioned a bit earlier. It is a very strong cation and therefore has a huge impact on decad balance in transition and dry cows and effects on low blood calcium. More of that in one of our other modules. And of course, it also increases under heat stress on cattle. Sulfur is another macro mineral and it's critical because we need it for microbial growth to form amino acids containing sulfur, such as methionine. Therefore, the ratio we like to see in rations is roughly for every 10 parts of, of nitrogen, one part of sulfur. Now remember, this is not protein, this is nitrogen equivalent, so make sure you make that adjustment. There's also some literature indicating that hoof hardness can be influenced or improved by getting adequate levels of sulfur in the 0.3 level. So based on this discussion, here are some guidelines. For the sake of time and not to bore you, I will not read all these numbers to you. You may wish to print this table out. You can see the macro minerals listed over there on the right side, excluding sodium and chloride, which we talked about a bit earlier. And you can see how these numbers vary for far off, close up, fresh and early lactation cows. So certainly you can leave these, see these numbers and see that uh, certainly gestation and lactation have a real impact on the levels we should be feeding. When we start looking at anionic salts or anionic products, we'll now see our calcium numbers, magnesium numbers, and chloride and sulfur numbers go up as well. This PowerPoint now shows our other two key macronutrients or minerals, that is sodium and chloride. Again, you can see the numbers are modestly low for dry cows. And in fact, in the close-up dry cows, some farmers will restrict sodium intake to avoid utter edema, which can be implicated. You can then see the higher numbers for fresh and early lactation cows. You can see our chloride numbers jumping way up when we get into the decad balance and trying to go to the anionic salt approach in the diets. If you're looking at decad, this is relatively new information on the close-up dry cow around a minus 50 to minus 150 and over 250 for lactating cows. This is expressed as milliequivalents per kilogram. Be sure you watch this because some people express it as milliequivalents per 100 grams and therefore we take off an extra zero. Be sure you have the number correctly. Under heat stress, some people will even go higher in lactating cows above the 250 level. So as we complete this module, here are some take-home messages. Certainly we recognize that macro minerals are related to both lactation and gestation needs. Second, testing of macro minerals is recommended several times a year using wet chemistry, not NIR analysis. And finally, decad balances should be calculated for both dry and lactating cows, and for lactating cows especially under heat stress. Well, that completes this module. Thanks. Have a great day.